Good morning, doctors. Thank you very much for your invitation. And it's a pleasure to talk to you about astigmatism management with toric IULs. Uh, so, uh, you know, when we talk of aberrations in the eye, there are, uh, you know, lower order refractive errors. And then we can talk about also higher order aberrations in the eye. And the red line actually separates the lower order aberrations from the higher order aberrations. And today we are going to speak about uh, the um, second order aberrations in the Zynike polynomials. And uh, to be more specific, we are talking about the astigmatism, uh, which is actually uh, uh, the second order um, aberrations in the Zynike polynomials. So many decades back, Duke Elder gave us this chart wherein he showed that uncorrected astigmatism is the second biggest source of uh, visual acuity loss, decrease in visual acuity. And if you see here, a patient with about 0.5 diopter of myopia or hyperopia, uh, his vision drops to around 6 by 9. But if the patient has around 0.75 diopter of astigmatism, we can see that there is an equal drop in visual acuity. So that is why they say that uncorrected astigmatism is the second biggest source of uh, decreased visual acuity. And, he, and many uh, you know, the papers actually refer astigmatism as a blurring, but uh, I do believe that it is not a blur if you compare it with myopia and astigmatism. While myopia or hyperopia is a blur, the patient sees a blur, with astigmatism, what you see is uh, as if the letters are smeared, which means, you know, if you have written with a gel pen and if you have rubbed your fingers across that gel before it has dried up, so you see a kind of smearing. So that is the same thing what we see over here, you know, with astigmatism, you know, you kind of see a smearing of those letters. Now, why correct astigmatism with tonic IULs? The reason behind that, behind that is that, you know, as when you correct astigmatism with tonic IULs, it always stays in the eye, you know, because if you are correcting with the glasses, then not every patient is wearing glasses for, uh, you know, the entire day. And we know that many patients actually go to the bathroom in the dead of the night without the specs on, with sleepy eyes, and they fall down. So it is always good to correct toric eye with the astigmatism with toric IULs, something that sits very close to the eye, something that sits in you know very close to the nodal point of the eye. Apart from the fact that if you leave it uncorrected, it can lead to asthenopia, which is a kind of headache that arises from constant patients trying to constantly trying to accommodate it. Now uh, we know that the girl's friend's eye model I says that uh, the total refractive power of the eye is around 58 diopters. Now, um, if we keep aside uh, the human crystalline lens, we know that two thirds of this refractive power comes from the cornea. And let's focus on the cornea. In this cornea, you can see that there's no defocus, there's no myopia, hyperopia, and there's no astigmatism either, right? So this kind of, of cornea is quite spherical in shape. And therefore, any ray of light that actually passes through this uh, kind of cornea, which is quite normal, um, reach the retina, you know, they, they reach the retina. But in astigmatism, when we talk of astigmatism, um, the cornea is a kind of rugby ball shape. And in this example, you can see that the horizontal and the vertical meridians are differently curved. So the vertical meridian is around 46 diopters, which is higher than the average power of the cornea. And the um, horizontal meridian is also 42 diopters, which is flatter than the average power, average cornea. So the vertical rays of light actually fall, the rays of light that goes through the vertical uh, section of the cornea, meridian of the cornea, falls before the retina. And the horizontal rays of light actually falls beyond the retina, behind the retina. So that is where what we call as the Strum's conoid or the conoid of Strum. And anywhere the rays of light falls, actually the patient sees a blur circle. Now, uh, we know that the astigmatism can be divided into regular astigmatism and irregular astigmatism. And what is a regular astigmatism? Regular astigmatism is one where uh, the uh, principal meridians, that is the steep 
meridian and the flat meridians are 90 degree away and they are indicated for uh, the uh, toric angles um for any kind of toric angles uh, for irregular astigmatism there is no such defined axis so irregular astigmatism is like a crushed paper you know the and and uh, that irregularity of the cornea could be because of structural in nature the patient could have a keratoconus keratoglobus pellucid marginal degeneration or it could be because of the dry eye so if the patient has dry eye uh, the, then uh, uh, the dry eye has to be treated first and then the biometry has to be done to see if there is any regular astigmatism in the cornea left in the cornea so uh, these are very familiar topography images um, a uh, regular astigmatism in a topography image appears like a bow tie a butterfly wing and that bow tie could be um, let me bring the pointer over here so that bow tie could be uh, vertically aligned which is the with the rule astigmatism or could be horizontally aligned which is against the rule astigmatism or could be oblique but in irregular astigmatism we are seeing that there's no definite axis or meridian of steep and flat meridians now uh, then with the rule astigmatism is uh, vertically oriented and against the rule astigmatism is horizontally oriented and in what axis i mean um, so when we when we uh, when the patient has with the rule astigmatism that means the vertical meridian the steep meridian is between 90 degree plus minus 30 degrees that is 60 to 120 degrees when the patient has against the rule astigmatism then the steep meridian is aligned 180 degrees plus minus 30 degrees and when the when the patient has oblique astigmatism the steep meridian will be aligned either 120 to 150 degrees or 30 to 160 degrees now astigmatism can also be classified into whether the patient has a simple myopic astigmatism or a compound myopic astigmatism um say for example the patient has a simple myopic astigmatism in this example what this means is that the vertical meridian is normal 44 diopters that's the average power of the cornea but here we see that the horizontal meridian is very steep so the rays of light that passes through this horizontal meridian are falling before the retina and that is why we call it a simple myopic astigmatism what do we call as compound myopic astigmatism here we can see that both the meridians the vertical as well as the horizontal meridians are very steep and here the rays of light um, from the vertical meridian falls before the retina and also the horizontal uh, meridian falls before the retina so that's a kind of uh, compound myopic astigmatism then the same uh, you know uh, the simple hyperopic astigmatism is also similar to the uh, simple myopic astigmatism except that it is the rays of light are now falling beyond the retina here we can see that with simple hyperopic astigmatism the vertical ray uh, the vertical meridian is average uh, it, it, uh, the average power of the cornea is 44 diopters but we can see that the horizontal meridian here is 41 diopters which is much flatter so any ray of light that goes through the horizontal meridian are now falling beyond the retina right so any ray of light that goes through the vertical meridian is falling on the retina rays of light that goes through the horizontal meridian are falling beyond the retina and that is what we call a simple hyperopic astigmatism compound hyperopic astigmatism again both the meridians are flat and therefore rays of light that goes through the vertical and horizontal meridian are falling beyond the retina and in the mixed astigmatism we see that one meridian is steep than 44 diopters which is the average power of the cornea and the other meridian is flatter than an average power of the cornea so rays of light in this example passing through the vertical meridian is falling before the retina and rays of light that is going um, you know through the horizontal meridian is now falling beyond the retina now when you are uh, implanting toric uh, you have to be aware of uh, the axis of the eye because you have to place the toric in a particular axis and uh, we always start with the left um, i you know i it start with the left eye and if you think of the left eye temporal that is the zero degree so the left eye temporal is the zero degree here and then you go to the uh, to the superior part which is the 90 degree and then you go to 180 degree so left eye temporal is zero degree left eye nasal is 180 degree 
and then in the right eye you start with zero degree right eye zero degree is in the nasal part 90 and then 180 degree which is the right eye temporal so the thumb rule is that the zero degree of the left eye is temporal 180 degree of the right eye is temporal you can remember that so if you are saying that i am actually putting the incision at zero degree then it is most likely that you are putting uh, the incision in the temporal portion of the left eye if you say you are putting the incision you are placing the incision at 180 degree then i would assume that you are on the right eye temporal now this is how i explain uh, uh, what is astigmatism in a simple language to people who join you know uh, not from an ophthalmology background or an optometry background uh, to counselors say for example so mr x here has 52 chocolates say and mr y has 46 chocolates so who has more chocolates mr x has more chocolates so plus 6 for mr x you can also write the same way um, uh, as minus 6 for Mr. Y. So plus 6 for Mr. X and minus 6 for Mr. Y in this example are the same thing. Similarly, you can also uh, write astigmatism you know, in a plus format or in a minus format. Now, how do you correct this? If you have to uh, think of giving equal chocolates for, for both Mr. X and Mr. Y, how do you correct this anomaly here is that you will have to then place a minus six to Mr. Six, uh, Mr. X. So you have to take back chocolates from Mr. X. Or you can, because Mr. Y has less chocolates, you can also give plus six to Mr. Y. So astigmatism can also be corrected with plus classes, that is by giving or minus classes by taking away. So in this example, the patient has with the rule astigmatism, right? At 90 degree over here with the rule astigmatism on the cornea. Then how do I correct it with glasses? I can correct it with minus glasses or I can correct it with plus glasses. If I have to correct it with minus glasses, I have to make sure that the minus is aligned to the 90 degree. If I have to correct it with the plus glass, then I have to make sure that in this example, the plus is aligned to 180 degree. So with glasses, you can correct it in both ways. Uh, similar, uh, sim as, as the, it's quite similar to the example that I have given before. Now, uh, let's come to the toric IULs. In toric IULs, it is not exactly like that of the glasses. Here, you are only working with convex lenses, right? Because the toric IUL is, is the, the main um, requirement of the IUL is actually that it is replacing the human crystalline lens, which is a convex lens. So toric lenses are all convex lenses, biconvex lenses mostly. So if you have, if your biometry has called for a 21 diopter, power so the iul power is 21 diopter and your high and your toric calculator has called for t2 diopters t2 so the toricity is t2 one diopter t2 has a one diopter so how will the lens power actually play here the 21 diopter will be the flat meridian of the lens that is the optic haptic junction over here 21 diopter so this 21 diopter will be aligned over here on the optic haptic junction. You can see the three dots over here. That marks the flat meridian of the lens. And because you have to put a T2, then 90 degree from there here, actually. So here is 21 diopter. And this part where I have this red arrow, you will have the T2, which is the 21 plus one diopter. So this lens will have at this um, meridian, it will have a 22 diopter. So 21 diopter on the optic haptic junction and 22 diopters at this meridian, uh, 90 degree from there. Now you have to align this onto the steep meridian of the cornea. So the steep meridian of the cornea say is this arrow, this red arrow over here. That's the steep meridian of the cornea. And then you have to align the lens, the, uh, the flat axis of the lens, the flat meridian of the lens, the optic haptic junction to the, uh, to the steep meridian of the cornea. So when you align the flat axis of the lens to the steep meridian of the cornea, automatically the steep meridian of the lens is aligned to the flat meridian of the cornea. And that is how the toric IUL takes care of the patient's astigmatism. Now, uh, most lenses actually are there from T2 to T9. Uh, the, uh, here I have an example of even toric lenses, acris of toric lenses, or, or the uh, technus toric lenses, they're all available in T2 to T, T9 diopters. The T2 corrects IL uh, cylinder power 
of one diopter in the in the in the IUL plane. So therefore, it corrects 0.7 diopters around 0.69 diopters on the corneal plane because you are placing the IUL in the back. The amount of correction on the cornea comes down, similar to what happens in the in, if you had to if you had a capsular break and you had planned for a 21 diopter, then you come down by 0.5 diopters when you're placing it on the sulcus. So the same way, actually, the IUL cylinder power is one diopter with the T2, but it corrects 7.69 diopters on the corneal plane. And the highest model that is commercially available with most lenses are the T9, which corrects around six diopters on the cylinder on the IUL plane, but it corrects around four diopters on the corneal plane. Now, what is the patient criteria? Uh, the most important patient criteria is that the patient should have a regular astigmatism. That's the most, that's, that to my, in my view, that's the only criteria. That's the only thing that you need to see, that the patient has uh, regular astigmatism. Now, how would you find out that the patient has regular astigmatism? Most biometry machines, you know, the keratometry machines will never be able to tell you that the patient has irregular astigmatism. So you have to rule out dry eye. The keratometry machines are always based on the premise that the steep and the flat maintenance are 90 degree away. So you need to have a topography to rule out dry eyes, but don't get desert. And if you don't have a topography, you can still do a toric lens. Just rule out the dry eye of the, uh, that the patient doesn't suffer from dry eye. Or when you are doing planning a toric, always plan for two eye biometry so that you can, uh, you know, correlate the two eyes. So, if the patient has more than one diopter of astigmatism in two eyes, the difference of astigmatism in the two eyes is more than one diopter, then I would say that you should do the biometry again because there's a high chance of irregularity in the cornea. Standard deviation, deviation of axis and magnitude should be also looked into. If you have a simple auto uh, keratometer, auto keratometer, auto ref, auto keratometer mode, then you can also see the standard deviation. It takes actually 10 readings, so you can go into the background. It gives you a reading, but at the back of it, there are 10 readings. If you look into this 10 readings, see that the standard deviation of the axis is not very high. Usually it should be less than 3.5 degrees as per Valen Hill. And the magnitude of the standard deviation of the magnitude, if you're if your lens star, if you have an optical biometry, if they give you the standard deviation, the lens star gives it, it should be less than 0.25 diopters or 0.2 diopters. And always try to correlate with the subjective refraction of the patient. If the subjective refraction of the patient is uh, not available, try to see the other eye. Right? It is seldom happens that the patient has with the rule astigmatism on the left eye and against the rule astigmatism on the, on the right eye. Um, you know, uh, that actually usually doesn't happen with significant amount of astigmatism. One thing that I was, uh, you know, harping in the last slide is that um, that correlating with the subjective refraction is important because many a times your biometrician is starting toric for the first time. They were not used to seeing the axis, especially if they have a manual keratometer. So here in this case, you see that this patient has against the rule astigmatism plus two at 180 degree. Subjective refraction also shows that the patient has an against the rule astigmatism, right? Minus two at 90 is plus two at 180. Uh, if you think of the example I took before. So uh, the, here the patient's uh, subjective refraction is matching the patient's um, astigmatism uh, that you have found out with the keratometer. So that is important. I uh, would also like to talk about today's modern datoric calculators here. Um, the uh, One of the calculators in you know, all company calculators, whether it's Hoya, Acrisoft, uh, you know, Alcon calculators or Technis calculators, they all give you the toric power model, they all give you the axis of implantation, and they also give you the estimated residual astigmatism post IL implantation. Now, most of these calculators, whether it's Alcons, Technis, or Toric, uh, Technis, or Hoya, they all uh, actually incorporate today uh, the posterior corneal astigmatism theoretically. So, uh, uh, sometime back, we never paid much attention to posterior corneal astigmatism, but uh, uh, Douglas Cox showed us in 2011, he published a paper in the JCRS, where he found out that 86 to 88 percent of the patients had posterior corneal astigmatism. And if you do not take that into account, you may be overcorrecting with the rule astigmatism and undercorrecting against the rule astigmatism. So it is so important that, you know, today's calculators actually take care of the posterior corneal astigmatism. Here I have an example from Hoya. Uh, they actually, know, uh, you know, integrate the Abolafia cock 
nomogram uh, in their calculator which takes into account the posterior corneal astigmatism so if you do not have a device which measures the posterior corneal astigmatism you can keep it on here so that the calculator takes care of the posterior corneal astigmatism albeit theoretically the same thing is done by the uh, the alcon toric calculator also and the jnj uh, toric calculator Talking about the surgical procedures, um, you have to do the reference marks and the access marking. The reference marking is done, you know, outside the OR in the patient in a sitting position and without blocking the patient. If you for any chance have to block the patient, then do the reference rem uh, marking first and then block the patient. But um, also when you're marking the patient, ask the patient to look wide open at a distance. But before that, I mean, do put uh, some amount of anesthetics on the, in the on the cornea, the barakin maybe, and dry it that uh, that eye because if you don't dry it, then the ink marks will not be there. So uh, ask the patient to look at the distance, maybe at four to six feet, so that there is not fusion of the you know not much convergence of the eyeball, and um, and then you mark the patient. And there, uh, if you are doing a manual marking, that's excellent. I mean, you know, toric is a forgiving lens. You may not have got to have very high uh, phi um, you know marker systems like uh, the Callistro or the Varian. Even if you do a mar manual reference marking, that is enough. And then you have to, uh, draw, you know, put some topical anesthesia. I ask the patient to fix it at the distance object, eye wide open, and then dry that eye. I mean, that is important, you know, so because uh, many a times we see that the ink marks are not visible enough in the OR by the time the patient has gone into the eye. And when you do the access marking, stop short of, uh, you know, 20 degrees anti-clockwise, stop short, so that you can remove the viscoelastics and then do the final analysis. A little bit of word on closing steps. You know, we had a study um, sometime back in the JCRS, I think in the British Journal of Ophthalmology, which where Professor Minapacha showed us. I mean, it is very it, the most of the rotations actually happen in the first one hour. Uh, most of the rotations happens in the first one hour and in first one week and one month in that order. So it is very important that after you have implanted the toric and the surgery has been done, you ask the patient to lie down, you know, uh, in the uh, for at least an hour, uh, so that the uh, lens settles down because that that is the time most important, uh, you know, that is the time when uh, most of the astigmatism, uh, uh, the lens rotation happens. Thank you very much for your attention and it was a pleasure to talk to you about astigmatism with toric eye